Well, uh, welcome. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening. Uh, thanks for finding the time to speak with us this morning on, I think the title of this round table is uh, the challenges for utilities and grid operators and the like and transitioning to 100% renewables or a carbon neutral future. Um, you know, I think we could probably organize a, a panel discussion that would argue the reverse, that there isn't going to be a transition, that, you know, there's nothing going to happen until there's a disruption happening, and then it's going to change like that. Uh, I've been reading a lot of that about that lately, but that's not our debate today. You know, we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about those things that we know and that we can see. And the folks in this uh, roundtable are, are charged with helping that transition. So we're going to in the, in the real world. And so we're gonna talk about some real world issues um, relative to the transition. This is a top of the mind subject for those of us in the US. It hasn't necessarily been a top of the mind subject in the past four years, but you know, now <laughs> it's, a, it's a new day in Dodge and we're happy campers. Uh, there's a pretty diverse group. Uh, we're having a perspective from a utility from public policy, from uh, entrepreneurship, from a NGO that spans the globe, uh, and from uh, Latin America in, in finance in financing uh, entrepreneurs. So welcome. A couple of um, housekeeping uh, items that we haven't covered, that we probably covered already. We're recording this uh, <clears throat> and we're gonna distribute it uh, afterwards uh, if you say something that's a job uh, uh, challenger, then let me know. We'll edit it out. But aside from that, we're going with what we're doing. Uh, please keep your mics muted and your cameras on. Um, and, you know, my, my goal here is to kind of have a discussion. Uh, I don't, we have a, uh, we're going to open up with Nancy uh, providing uh, an overview of the uh, LA 100 study, and then we're going to go around the room. I'm going to ha have some starting questions. I want to begin by, first of all, thanking uh, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. Uh, you've been a terrific uh, partner. Uh, we've been working together for well, more than 10 years, I'm sure. Uh, been a terrific partner at, with LACI and now with Engine. And Nancy, who, by the way, is, I think I've got this, this, uh, Title right, Assistant General Manager in charge of an external and regulatory affairs and Chief Sustainability Officer. Is that correct? All right. Okay. So Nancy's got the um, challenge ahead of us of describing uh, the LA uh, 100 study. I think the formal name is LA 100 uh, percent uh, uh, sustainable uh, study. Um, and to me, it's a, this is, by the way, folks, this is how this whole thing started. I was talking with one of Nancy's associates, Steve Ball, and talking about the study. And I think it's a, it's a remarkable study. Uh, first of all, I think it's a remarkable, remarkable question that a utility asks. Even just asking the question, how do we get from here to there uh, is pretty brave. To actually make it, do a study on it, and as exhaustive of a study as uh, LA100 is, is really remarkable. So Nancy, I'm gonna turn it over to you for a few minutes and uh, take us through the study and, and welcome. <clears throat> Thanks Fred and uh, nice to join everybody here today. Uh, it's always good to see you Fred. Um, and uh, thank you for uh, organizing this panel. Um, so let me, let me back up a little bit and start with what is the LA Department of Water and Power. Uh, so, uh, we are the U.S.'s uh, largest um, municipally owned utility, so we are part of the city of Los Angeles, and we are uh, a fully vertically integrated electric utility and also a water provider uh, to the four million residents of Los Angeles. And uh, I think it's safe to say that LADWP uh, has been on a journey of uh, transformation uh, probably over the last 20 years or so uh, from looking like a pretty traditional 
uh, utility in the US uh, largely dependent on fossil fuels to generate electricity uh, to when that is uh, increasingly dependent on renewable energy to generate electricity and, um, and on the way to uh, getting to 100% clean energy. Um, so usually I end that by saying a date, but that we've had a little bit of um, some developments on that end. Um, so California, the state of California in uh, back a few years ago <clears throat> adopted a piece of legislation called SB 100, uh, which um, directed the state's utilities to get to 60% of uh, 60% renewable portfolio standard by 2030 and 100% clean energy uh, by 2045. And um, as, as uh, part of the city of Los Angeles, our city council said, well, that's great. Um, let's figure out how to get there and, and asked LADWP to undertake a study to uh, to identify the actual investments that would get us uh, to 100% clean energy at that moment by 2045. Um, and so we engaged with the uh, National Renewable Energy Laboratory, which is a, a part of the US Department of Energy. Uh, and they're very expert at um, developing scenarios and, uh, and really uh, analyzing and understanding how uh, how a uh, utility system works. And on top of it, they have a supercomputer. Uh, so it was, uh, it was fun to work with them. Um, and the, the, the city council asked us to look at a few things, sort of what are the pathways and the costs to get to 100% clean energy? What are the benefits, the environmental and the public health benefits of doing that? Uh, what does this mean for the local economy and jobs? And how do how do we engage communities and promote environmental justice? Uh, so we undertook this study in uh, 2016. Um, we had a stakeholder advisory group made up of uh, stakeholders all around uh, the city, from uh, environmental groups, community groups, business groups, um, other utilities, um, uh, and so they. Um, helped us to identify the scenarios uh, to look at. And so um, the, the conclusions of the study uh, were really um, that 100% renewable energy is achievable. And especially uh, if it's coupled with the electrification of other sectors, so uh, the transportation sector and buildings, and that it will provide significant uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction benefits, as well as air quality and other public health benefits. And that um, all communities will share in this, uh, in these benefits, um, but you have to be intentional about um, ensuring that the programs and policies uh, benefit all. And that the net economic assessment showed that um, the various scenarios uh, would not affect um, the economy, the local economy in any significant manner. Uh, so, um, and, you know, I, I don't think it's, uh, I think people around the world un understand that this is a hot button issue in the US about the impact on communities of, of uh, strategies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to, uh, to promote 100% clean energy. And that, uh, we can get started now as we as we have and we started down this path but there are these what we'll what uh, nrel called these no regret options um, that will help us to achieve significant em emission reduction benefits by the year 2030. Um, and so the you know i don't want to go into too much detail about the study itself it's available on, on, on nrel's website uh, and you can find it on ours as well and it's worth taking a look at because it's very exhaustive uh, and they modeled literally thousands of scenarios down to the actual you know, building in uh, looking at buildings in Los Angeles. Um, but they focused on a number of uh, scenarios 
one called the SB100 scenario. So this is the 100% clean energy by 2045. Uh, some early uh, scenarios, how do we get to, can we get to 100% clean energy earlier? Uh, transmission focus, non-transmission focus. So a whole series of, of studies. So a whole series of scenarios. But one of the interesting thing is um, uh, as uh, President Biden um, uh, you know, announced a goal for the U.S. to, to the U.S. electricity sector should be 100% clean energy by 2035. The question, uh, which we had already been looking at, was that possible? And the answer, uh, according to uh, LA100, is it is possible. Um, so uh, last week, um, the mayor of Los Angeles, uh, Mayor Eric Garcetti, gave his annual State of the City address where he kind of laid out the priorities for the city over the next year. Uh, and he talked about the LA100 study and um, sort of announced some uh, new commitments by LADWP to uh, get to 80% clean energy or 80% renewable energy by 2030. And that would mean we were 97% carbon free by 2030. And that we are going to, uh, commit to, to achieving the vision of getting to 100% carbon free uh, by 2035. So not 2045, but 2035. And so that will mean um, accelerating some of our investments uh, in renewable energy, um, which, uh, you know, uh, which we've been doing and, and um, investing in some innovative um, not, not just technologies, but innovative projects that combine solar and storage, uh, cheap solar and cheap storage. Uh, and, um, and then looking at um, green hydrogen as an option to uh, power some of the, uh, the remaining fossil fuel plants. So uh, we have a coal plant in Utah that will shut down in 2025 and be replaced. Uh, it was initially with a gas turbine and it is a a hydrogen capable gas turbine that uh, the day it turns on can operate with about 35% hydrogen. It's a sort of a renewable energy hub um, out in the middle of nowhere in, in Utah. Uh, and um, there's renewable energy coming in from other states to the transmission lines there. Uh, so in case looking at some of those innovative um, technologies both uh, outside of uh, LA and inside of LA uh, for our in-basin uh, power plants and looking at uh, distributed energy resources and other types of grid innovation to help us get to achieve those goals uh, cost effectively. And really looking at how it affects you know, all of our communities. So trying to really keep in mind that we, we, want, uh, we want to sort of share the wealth around Los Angeles uh, and make sure that everybody shares in the benefits of this uh, cleaner future. So, Ed? You're, you're on mute, Fred. Okay, yeah. There are a number of remarkable uh, findings in this study from my perspective. Uh, of course, the good news is you just said is we can make it, we can even make it earlier. Okay. One of the remarkable things though, is that if I read it correctly, it's, I don't want to use the word easy going, but it's easy to get to 90%. It's really tough to go from 90 to 100%. Uh, can you speak a little bit to that? So yeah, I think that's, that's definitely the, the challenge. Uh, and it's one, I think, uh, even in, uh, in California's uh, SB 100 law, they sort of had, hadn't really defined what is, what does a hundred percent mean? So can you, you know, if it's not delivered to the grid, if you're using fossil fuels, for example, for, uh, you know, for, for, for uh, more like grid, grid operations, does that count? In this case, uh, the, uh, the constraint that we put on the study was that you couldn't, there could be no fossil fuels. So things like, uh, you know, we could use biofuels potentially uh, and, and other things. So I think that that's right. The, the other thing that they said, which was pretty interesting, was that um, that the that you really have to go big on electrification because that will help 
to bring down the overall costs of doing this. So in a sense, kind of um, uh, you know, transferring greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector, the building sector into the, into the electricity sector, uh, but that the increased electricity sales as a result will help bring, bring down the cost. So a lot of interesting findings, a lot of stuff we still need to kind of work our way through, uh, but, but yeah, and I think, I think uh, we will we'll be undertaking that challenge to figure out that last 10% a little faster than we had initially anticipated. Well, once again, I think it's, it's surprising uh, and by the way, for those of uh, those of you who have never been to Los Angeles, transportation is a big deal here, <laughs> right? And uh, we love our cars. <laughs> yeah, and the whole effort of, of electrifying the basin is uh, pretty important. And it's kind of surprising to me that if we if we do more of that, the costs come down, uh, and so that's a, a, a big deal as well. Uh, any would anybody like to make any comments or have any questions? Uh, uh, it's open uh, season for Nancy. Oh, no, I don't mean that, but <laughs> you know, Tarek, you and I were talking about um, the difficulty in uh, the last mile, you know, in, in the kinds of, of technology uh, gaps uh, we've seen. Is that the equivalent of getting 90%, you know, and then, you know, the last 10%? Is that equivalent kind of thinking? Well, no? <laughs> I mean, of course, I mean, there are, of course, challenges. I mean, when we talk about the last mile, of course, where that's where we, we are also concerned as a, as a development partner with, with many countries is how do you bring power and energy to those that don't have it? And how do you do it sort of through renewable energy? So that's where a lot of our effort has been growing, particularly in, in, in broad parts of the world where um, uh, access to, to affordable, but also reliable and, and clean power supply is not is not there yet so 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 we argue that this is the opportunity to to do it differently and to do it through through uh, through renewable energy I, I would imagine that the challenges there are much less uh, different type of challenges but I would think they are much less uh, um, demanding than turning an existing power system uh, with 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 in an advanced economy, Toward 100% renewable, I can understand what Nancy say that going from the 90 to the 100% that is going to be a daunting challenge, and I think it is it is a it is a, a moment where a lot of efforts today. I mean, this, this year is quite a lot of efforts and discussion around this. Um, we call it the year of energy because uh, at least within the international development community, um, the, the UN system and and with with the US joining the climate. <laughs> sort of uh, accord again. So there's a big momentum on, on reaching this uh, net zero targets by 2050 and achieving the SDG seven, the, the sustainable development uh, goal on, on energy by 2030, which is basically um, uh, partly speaking to uh, increasing the rate of renewable energy in, in the energy mix um, to a substantial amount, but also um, delivering universal energy access and, and that is a big challenge uh, and and of course improving energy efficiency so these three multiple goals are, are interlinked and and uh, um, and and uh, uh, speak to the challenges I think I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we started with Nancy because uh, um, the the uh, the case you bring from Ali, uh, from from Los Angeles makes it a bit more real to talk about sort of some of these challenges and 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 the daunting uh, 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 challenges ahead of us. Uh, if, if you bring it on a global scale, of course, it's so different and so diverse, but one could sort of bring three fundamental issues, at least in the power sector uh, side that we come across often, especially when you operate in, in, in developing and emerging markets. One is that you're dealing a lot with, with um, Utilities that are underfunded, uh, which require investment in grids and infrastructure, which also, which means that also are not bankable uh, in many in many parts of the world. Um, the second also that is the the, the markets around. Uh, so so you need to put a lot of efforts into the 
regulations and the um, uh, and the the uh, what we call regulation of the markets to allow for for integration of renewable energy energy into into the power system. So there's a lot of, of issues there. Um, and and the third thing is is basically the scenarios that are out there. There's two different thoughts there. One country is gonna do it on their own. So you have to talk about interconnections. And, and so that's that's another scenario that you have to bring into the equation. So, so these are part of the, the ongoing discussion uh, that is, is going on today uh, around transitioning power systems toward 100 renewables. So, so, so some countries can, can really, uh, with the resources and, 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 uh, uh, and powerful utilities can do it, but, but many countries, uh, they're facing different challenges there. So this is a quick reaction on, on that particular point, but I, there's more to talk about the energy transition in general and what we can do, and I'm happy to, to dwell on this, so I don't want to take a lot of the time on this point. So back to so, you. I, I forgot to um, <clears throat> mention that this subject has been so popular, and uh, a lot of people wanted to be part of this roundtable, that we have another roundtable. Same time tomorrow, different set of, of players. Tomorrow's a round table is much more focused on OECD co uh, countries. But my question, Nancy, is, and we're gonna talk to a, a number of other utilities tomorrow. Is there something, should other utilities uh, do this kind of study? Is there something to be learned for others in that respect? Yeah. Well, I, it, it was a big undertaking, so I, I wouldn't necessarily, uh, we, and we've been asked, you know, sort of, ooh, how much did you spend? And, and it took four years. Uh, but, you know, but I think it, um, and I, so I don't know that everybody has to go and find somebody with a supercomputer to run, you know, thousands of scenarios and model down to the actual building. Uh, which, so, by the way, which, by the way, if, my, if I read correctly, there were 635,000 properties you modeled. Yeah. 7 million buildings. Yeah. Every electric wire in the city? Wow. Pretty much. I mean, yeah. really every sort of connection almost. Uh, so, uh, so, but it was important to get, I think, down to that level of, of specificity really to, um, you know, have, uh, I think, create the sort of um, confidence in the models that, that they really were evaluating what it meant for, for our system. So I'm not sure that everybody has to do this in depth, but I think it does potentially serve as a model to say, you know, this is all possible and yeah, you should, you know, you can't just sort of wave it off as we don't know how to do this. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but, but there are still questions I think that need to be answered in terms of that last 10% that, uh, that is it technology, you know, what you really need is sort of dispatchable, um, resources that are there and maybe they're used very infrequently, but when you need them, you really need them. Um, and how do you, you know, how do you ensure that you have the, that capability? I mean, I think the other question, um, and it's, you know, I, I, you know, the U.S. has a view of sort of, a, and, and Americans have an expectation about uh, reliability uh, of the grid. Uh, and and here in California, the questions about resiliency of the grid, the ability to to um, cope with uh, whether natural disasters or other interruptions, um, those are all really important questions, as well as uh, the environmental and the economic questions of sort of how much are we willing to invest, uh, and what are those what how do we ensure those benefits are. Uh, are uh, spread across uh, across all of our residents. So, um, I think the I read, so at least ask the questions. Uh, if not, uh, if not, uh, find your favorite researchers with the supercomputer to run th thousands of scenarios. So uh, let's shift gears. Let's uh, get on the plane and fly to Buenos Aires. Uh, uh, we're, you know, Tarek, by the way, I think is in Vienna. You know, Nancy and I are in LA, so we're going to have a global uh, 
Now, if we were going to fly to Buenos Aires, I would be in coach, of course. So, uh, Sebastian, uh, welcome. Um, Sebastian, uh, maybe to simplify it, I, to me, uh, you wrote the book on how to uh, de-risk investment in uh, sustainable uh, energy. And I've asked Sebastian to give us a mini case history of that. Um, because I know it's a, well, first of all, it was highly successful. I think you, what, you attracted $7 billion worth of investment. And this is in Argentina. And, you know, we share, Argentina and the US um, don't share a lot of things, but one of the things I think we share is to some degree, at least in the last four years, a um, um, uncertainty in markets. Uh, yeah. So, so Sebastian, welcome. Um, Sorry, if I just you. could interrupt for one second. Sure. I also share my mother, who was born and raised in Buenos Aires. So. Oh, right. oh, really? Wow, <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> it's less than six degrees of, of uh, connectivity here. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, Fred and, and friends. Uh, really appreciate the, the invitation. Um, let, me, let me start uh, at the beginning. Um, Perhaps the main challenge that we have in emerging markets, and of course, Argentina is one of them and is immersed in, in these uh, challenges as well, is the restriction to the capital market. And you know that renewables, clean infrastructure, infrastructure, long-term infrastructure need, needs a lot of capital. And uh, so in one side, we are saying that there is a huge or an important restriction in the emerging economies to access to the capital. And in the other side, we are saying that in order to build long-term infrastructure, we need to access long-term capital. So this sort of, uh, perhaps a, a sort of an oxymoron that is not like that, is what we face in, in emerging markets. Also in the context of a gigantic climate issue, that is not only um, in the developed world, but also in emerging markets. So um, I, I was invited by the president Macri in the last administration to join the executive branch to basically to, um, to deploy renewables, to develop uh, a, a proper renewable energy program that can really play um, a good game in the energy transition in the country. Um, 2016, the country was immersed in a profound energy crisis and in a profound economic crisis with five different types of uh, X-ray, peso dollar, with holdouts problems, with, uh, you can imagine what it means for an international investor to bring capital to come to a country with this kind of investment environment and political environment that I'm describing that unfortunately is, is what Argentina suffers uh, even today. Uh, so with this in mind, and uh, with the, um, even before 2016, in 2015, I wrote the Renewable Energy National Law with this chipset, trying to understand how to unlock capital from the international capital market in order to bring uh, um, investment to this economy. So I uh, developed what we call the Renewal Program immediately after the law that I wrote was passed by uh, and finally enacted at the end of 2015. So in 2016, I accepted the invitation from uh, President Macri to join the executive branch. In this, um, in this role under Minister for Renewable Energy, I developed what to, uh, uh, it is called the Renovar program. Renovar is uh, a procurement process with interesting condiments that we added uh, to a regular one in order to unlock what we understood was needed, this access to the capital market. So, um, Renovar was designed around uh, three main elements, working together to provide a complete uh, framework to facilitate uh, the full process from uh, project selection to financing to um, construction. So uh, the first is a clear and transparent and effective set of tender rules, which is not minor in emerging economies. 
The second uh, was an special, um, I would say, crafted bankable power purchase agreements. And the third, um, a strong and credible warranty scheme. Of course, the idea of this warranty scheme was to reduce the political and economic risk. So basically this is the fundamental part of Renovar, what I call the core, or the kernel of, of Renovar. And uh, it was made with um, a scheme that basically uh, enhanced the bankability of the contracts and, uh, and protects the uh, companies, the investment against basically three things, um, non-payment and or uh, delay payment for the produce and deliver electricity. So basically off-taker, part of the off-taker risk an early termination of the contracts through um, a compensation implemented via uh, a put option in the contracts. So basically offering the, um, the right to the projects and obligation to the national state to follow that right in case of something happen and something is uh, basically country risk. So in convertibility and transferability change in law. So basically what we um, have implemented with these steps is to, uh, we, we jump from the off-taker risk into the sovereign risk from level one of the warranties into the level two of the warranties. And again, if you are an international investor and you say, yeah, but uh, that's fantastic, but how much capital do you have in a scroll account that you are building for the stage one of your uh, warranties? And of course, you, you are not able to, to put, to incorporate the 20 years PPA in advance, just to secure that along 20 years, nobody will suffer any problem. So that's impossible. So we, uh, we design a, a rollover warranty that goes with the PPA, with all the uh, companies to protect them about any possible delay of the off-taker in the payment. So basically everyone uh, had to receive their payments on due date. That's the only way to promote project finance, uh, a very interesting uh, way to promote uh, investment in, in renewables. And of course, when we put ourselves we, we, um, in, the, in each of these steps and we say, okay, let's go to the worst case scenario. What happened if, what happened if, no? what happened if the off taker is not able to pay? What happened if the sovereign government is not able to cover uh, what it was planned to cover. So on purpose for, um, for fostering the appetite in the international community, we brought a third level of warranties to backstop the obligation of the sovereign state that is backing stop the obligation of the off taker. So the third level was um, in the hands of the World Bank. I brought the World Bank <clears throat> to structure a on purpose warranty uh, to backstop the obligation of the, of the national government. Um, and of course, it's very interesting because you are now bringing a AAA warranty. So whatever happened, you will receive your payment um, in US dollars in New York, if you want. So on convertibility, in transferability, all these kind of issues that are mainly the country risk that we, that we have here are pretty much uh, canceled with a, a sort of warranty like this. And this was implemented also with an indemnity agreement with the national government in order not to be expensive <laughs> for the projects. So um, let me summarize the conclusion of, of this uh, sort of, sort of uh, shielding scheme that we, that we brought. Um, at the end of 2015, the country uh, was signing contracts, solar contracts in the range of $350 megawatt hour. And you say, how is that possible? Well, you can imagine that nobody will bring capital into a country that is used to change the rules almost every year for 20 years PPA. So as I always say, 20 years PPA means five administrations. <laughs> Here, there, where you are, pretty much everywhere. Yeah. And we, nobody, know exactly who's going to be the next. So you can imagine who's going to be two, three more <laughs> further, right? So um, that's a, that is the reason why uh, at the end of 2015, uh, 15, before this implementation, 
uh, the country subscribe contracts in the range of $300, $350 megawatt hour because that means that the payback for the investor was in the range of one administration within four years, right? So in six months time, we brought uh, prices down by a factor of seven. So into the $50 range by implementing this innovative way of uh, structuring long-term infrastructure uh, programs, projects. Uh, we offer um, 1,000 in the first round and 1.2 gigawatts in the second round, and we receive more than eight times over subscription. All of the projects from international, uh, most of them from international players with quarter million dollar per megawatt in performance bond and in the balance sheet. So very powerful offers. Uh, we received a boom of investment, was really a shock of investment in less than two years of 7 billion US dollars, five gigawatts. Today, uh, the country has new 116 power uh, station, renewable power station, mainly wind and solar, and 37, if I'm not wrong, uh, and still under construction. So every week, an extra one, power station, renewable power station is coming online, is being commissioned. Uh, last November, we picked 23.3% of the whole country with renewables, excluding large hydro. So basically wow. everything from uh, wind, solar that we developed a couple of years ago. Uh, we are in an average, last month we closed an average of 12% of the whole country. So reaching 14% at the end of this year of the whole country. We overpassed nuclear energy first time in the history. Uh, it's almost 80 years of history that we have in, in nuclear power. Um, some extra condiments, uh, color notes. Uh, Argentina became last year ninth global position in the renewable energy attractiveness index, the RECA in index that published. Ernst and Young, and first in Latin America, um, the country represented for Vestas, you know, Vestas, the largest wind turbine manufacturer in the world, uh, their third global market last year. And uh, perhaps now, if we understand or if we assess how it works, Renovar under stress, because today, again, the country is suffering a lot of economic restrictions and problems. Uh, it is unfortunately, but fortunately, working very good. Um, Renovar projects or projects under the Renovar scheme are the only projects in the whole electricity system that are receiving their payments on due date today. Uh, and this is not minor, and this is uh, basically thanks to the way it was uh, structured. So, of course, we, myself, my team, we are very happy trying now to promote this to other emerging economies. Wow. Um, <clears throat> anybody can jump in here. Uh, the, I guess my, qu my question is, is, what was the selling proposition to get this approved? <laughs> You know. Ah, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. Well, I, I can tell you a couple of uh, interesting stories, or, or even one. I mean, the, the main one. I spoke. I mean, I took office in January 2016, and at the end of this month, after I developed the, the whole idea, I I uh, met the president of the World Bank, uh, trying to convince him about the need that I had for securing the third level of warranty in my warranty stream, right? In my warranty flow. Uh, and I remember as it were today, I mean, he told me, Sebastian, this is not possible. Um, you're asking me to do something in a time frame that, because my time frame was to do it in six months, uh, that uh, is not possible, you know, bureaucracy, et cetera, et cetera, multilaterals. Uh, we never done this before. And uh, we don't believe, even in the case we may try, we don't believe this is gonna work. So that was January, 2016. 
I remember I had a conversation with the president of the country uh, and he called the president of the World Bank. I flew to Washington. I explained again everything uh, there. And uh, they say, we still don't believe it's going to work, but we have the mandate to at least try. So let's try. And after we have implemented everything, a year after, the same person came to my office saying, uh, this is amazing. We have to repeat this everywhere. So why don't we do something in Colombia, in Ecuador, in Peru, in Asia, in, in, in Africa? So this is what GreenMap is, uh, is doing uh, today. Basically what I call a 2.0 version of uh, what we have done in Argentina, but for other emerging economies. Uh, I see that we're getting a number of uh, questions from our uh, audience, uh, and I'm going to ask them to hang on, hang in there. We're going to come back at the end of this uh, and have um, uh, questions from the audience. You know, Marcus, I see you kind of nodding your head. You know, Marcus is a an entrepreneur. What of 19 years, 20 years working in in Spain and in, in Germany and now Mexico in developing uh, solar projects. Um, so I, I suspect that you can appreciate what Sebastian is saying. Wow. <laughs> Congratulations, Sebastian. That's amazing what you have done. And yeah, so but thank you very much, Fred, first of all, of, uh, for inviting me and being part of this panel with these amazing panelists as well. So, yeah, so what we are facing in, in Mexico is, is clearly something similar. Developers, of takers, investors need a policy uh, framework giving long-term certainty because if not, it is really difficult to attract in investment. And if you put uh, also some conditions in, in this uh, cocktail that make even uh, difficult to get uh, investment for your prayers, that even worse. No? For example, last year, the Mexican government stopped the release of permits of new uh, utility scale renewable uh, power plants under the criteria of reliability of the electrical system due to some uh, blackouts supposedly produced by an excess of renewable energy production in some part of the, of the country. So that means that uh, in the coming three years, most likely no new renewable energy power from utility scale systems will be introduced in the system. Since investors, as you said, are looking for more uh, friendly policy markets like Colombia, Chile or Argentina in that case. So last but uh, even worse, uh, the, the government is working in a policy framework that will boost the national oil industry partly by delivering for fuel oil to obsolete power plants, which is amazing no? from, from our <laughs> point of view. On the other hand, you have this uh, distributed generation that is not uh, on the view of the government, but uh, solar can be implemented on, 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 on houses, commercial and industrial rooftops having a positive impact on resiliency of the system, reducing energy loses and enhancing the efficiency of the system. Although all these advantages, we see that in some parts of the country, like in the peninsula of Yucatan, that has not enough local energy generation and that imports a high percentage of uh, energy through one transmission line that is congested many hours throughout the day in the summer season, distributed generation is being stopped locally because of the lack of capacity in the distribution lines to get new capacity installed. So you get people that is investing in solar and once they submit uh, the, all this paperwork to utility to get the, the interconnection, they get a big no as an answer and this energy cannot be used, which is amazing. The, the investment has been done, but they have no permissions to use this energy. So Fred, how do we get to that point? I, we consider there is three main uh, points uh, that, are, that have brought us to under this situation. The first is the lack of investment in modernization of transmission and distribution lines in the, in the last decade. And the second would be the, the, the lack of policy framework enable developers to use batteries, for, for example, together with solar in order to improve the reliability of the system. 
And the last is the, the lack, the, the current lack of uh, political willing to in having a carbon neutral uh, energy sector, which is really bad. And our company, we are in the front line. We are developers of uh, distributed generation projects. We are not yet working in, in utility scale. And well, we are facing a very tough situation. And, and we know many companies are being killed and are disappearing uh, under this situation. So how are we approaching this situation? We are innovating, Fred, this is key. Innovation in the, is, the, is the best tool under our point of view that we can have in this uncertain time. We are introducing innovative hybrid energy systems, including solar and batteries, creating our own monitoring system using artificial intelligence and data science tool to predict demand and energy performance while predicting as well weather conditions. So we avoid as well that is something that I've been facing in, in many countries, Spain and now in Mexico, uh, as the, the, the interaction with the authorities in regions where the grid capacity is collapsed by installing off-grid systems or limiting the energy export of sur uh, surplus production. Uh, for example, we, we now here are in the middle of uh, Mexico City in an industrial area powered by an hybrid off-grid system. So we have any problem, we have energy, we don't suffer the, the fluctuance of the energy quality and we are green. So that's, that's key. So you, you can uh, call us the resistance of a new carbon neutral economy here in the first line of, the, <laughs> of, the, of this uh, challenge. No? Can you give uh, us a, I know it's gonna to be tough to do it in a brief point, but to make sure that everybody understands the kind of shift in uh, political leadership and what that has what impact that's had in, in Mexico, because we went through the same kind of uh, uh, transition, you know, in 2016. You know. Yeah. Um, so. Um, sorry, can you repeat the question? The question is, what, how has the politics changed the, the policy relative to uh, the energy transition? Because I remember not that long ago, Mexico was being heralded as, as a uh, leader in uh, renewable energy and, and privatization and all of that. Uh, uh. Yeah, so exactly the opposite by uh, empowering the national oil industry and producing uh, fuel oil that is going to be burned by the national utility company uh, in order to produce energy. So that's what the government wants to do is uh, strengthening the, 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 the national oil industry by burning fossil fuels and polluting the, the, the air and, and damaging the, the, the health of the people here. That's amazing. And right now, is there a particular part of the country that is um, uh, more receptive to renewables? You know, in, in the US, each state has its own policies to some degree and is more or less uh, uh, receptive. Yes, um, you, you may find different regions like Guanajuato or Sonora or even the, the, in some parts of the peninsula of the peninsula of Yucatan where the govern, governors try to push renewable energy. But the problem is, is that the uh, final decisions are federal, are, are made by the government. So um, the, 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 the one and only in the short run, the one and only solution is uh, trying to uh, avoid the interaction with the authorities, uh, just using batteries in order to produce your own energy and use when you need it, and uh, try to avoid the, the, yeah, the permits and, uh, and all these things. Uh, Jorge, I want to jump to you. Um, we've, because I you have a great deal of experience in financing projects like Marcos is talking about, and of course, what Sebastian is trying to, uh, is trying to attract in, in Argentina. Um, I, I believe that you've, you've been working with the private uh, financing advisory network, which works very closely with UNIDO, um, and its focus is on finding financing for entrepreneurs in renewable energy. I thought maybe you could speak a little bit to that and the challenges thereof, and, and feel free to jump in in other areas. 
Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, yes, in fact, the Private Finance Advisory Network is, is a, resides within UNIDO. It's a UNIDO program. And uh, what we focus on is precisely as you suggest. We want to make it easier. We want to make sure that the enabling environment, assuming the enabling environment works, that the enabling environment is in place, um, that we can match the available resources, and there's still quite a few, there are actually quite a few available resources available, uh, sorry, the tautology, um, available for projects of this nature. And there's lots of ideas and there's lots of projects, but there's a fair amount of matching that we have to do and strengthening and managing expectations on both sides. Uh, and uh, we find that in the field, that is probably the most valuable thing that we do as we bring together groups of investors that are interested in either a sector or a geographic area on the one hand and try to match them with projects that are available and seeking some type of partnership. It could be investment. It could be um, qualitative, not quantitative type of investment as you well. You work mainly in Latin America, correct? Yes, mainly in Latin America. And I have to make a point here because I think that it was, it's, it's, it's astounding. It's actually, it's phenomenal that you were able to uh, get the story of Argentina and the Renovar program in the same place as what's happening with Mexico, because this has happened in too many places. And one of the things that's unique about the program Sebastian designed, it's it's looking to smooth that curve so that projects can focus on the fundamentals. And so the difficulties remain and the enabling environment remains. <laughs> the, 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 the difficulties in Mexico that are being described by Marcos are described, have been described by many, many entrepreneurs. And in fact, projects have fallen apart. They have just paused. And so, and so uh, but there's still financing available. And so what we do is we try to focus on the entrepreneur, on the business case, and then we will match it with the right impact investor or the right multilateral. But every, there's no formula. Every single project is different. Every single country is different. And the regulatory environment is significant. I'll add just one more thing. I've also become engaged with supporting some, the NDC updates of several, of several countries that have to submit their new NDCs uh, based on the Paris Accords. And you find that uh, as they do their modeling, and I've done some modeling with NREL as well, in terms of the modeling of what it could look like to be more aggressive in terms of GH greenhouse gas reductions, uh, it leads you to some important variables. And then it takes you to precisely the issue highlighted both by Sebastian and by Marcos. What are the policies and measures that would make it easier to get those emission reductions? One of those additional puzzle pieces after that, once you determine that, what policies and measures would make it easier is what kind of investment strategy? How do you treat both the foreign investor and how do you improve the domestic investor and the conditions of success for these types of projects? So without question, um, this, is, this is an extremely, extremely fertile space right now. Uh, COVID slowed things down a little bit, uh, but what we're seeing is that there is an, there's an, the, the move, the trend towards the first and the second energy transition uh, is, um, is significant. Wow. So uh, I, I, find it I find it interesting that um, your, one of the things you do primarily is match, right? Yes. Investors to projects. What do those investors look like these days? Well, it depends. It depends on the type of project. Well, sorry, that's that's a really easy, broad answer. It depends, yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> Everything depends. <laughs> but uh, but but in this particular case, for um, for this segment of renewable energy, energy efficiency, uh, the integration of storage, um, distributed generation to address energy poverty in either rural or urban settings, uh, it's gonna it's gonna vary. By and large, they're impact investors. They're investors that have carved out a certain percentage of their portfolio specifically for these types of investments. They, they 
they are a little more patient, but let's not bear, but let's continue to bear in mind that returns are important because sustainability means sustainability all the way across. It's gotta be sustainable from the green perspective, from the environmental perspective, from the social perspective, but it's gotta make sense commercially so that it then continues to, to replicate. So by and large, these, these are either family offices or these are small impact investors or big impact investors, or they're, they're carved out of bigger funds. And, uh, and the multilaterals are present, the donors are present. Through Unido and PFAN, we, we interact a great deal uh, with these types of investors. The Green Climate Fund, of course, is a big player. So the ecosystem is very, very different, which is why we do that matching because some funds are interested in biomass. Some funds are interested in just solar. Other funds are interested in capturing the efficiencies around, um, around, uh, around energy savings and then moving forward from that perspective. So it, 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 it varies. But by and large, we're working a lot with private sector funds, which is different than even 20 years ago or even 15 years ago. Marcos, have you, have you come across PFAN before? I met last year before the pandemic, Jorge, in Mexico City, and we began speaking about one project, but everything stopped. But I will call you later. <laughs> Good. Well, we've done a match we're, already. We're open we've for done business. a match already. Okay, Tarek, <laughs> I'd like to uh, um, come back to you. Now, Tarek is, uh, is the Director of Energy for the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, obviously a global organization, but focused really on emerging economies, emerging markets. And you have a, I thought maybe it would be good now for you to talk a little bit about the challenge. I'm sure the challenges you've just been hearing now reflect what you hear in other parts of the world. No, absolutely, uh, uh, Fred. I mean, it's, it's uh, uh, the stories uh, that Sebastian mentioned and, 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 uh, and uh, Marcos, uh, because I also uh, was in a, in a, partly before I joined Unido, I was, um, working for the Regional Center for Renewable Energy that cover the Mediterranean countries, the North Africa and Middle East. And the idea there was exactly to work on, on, on improving the framework conditions for more renewable energy projects to come on the market and typical issues of, of, of uh, power purchase agreement, de-risking investments, uh, creating a favorable environment for investors. All, and they still persist, I think, until today. But uh, to come back to, to the role you need to play, I mean, actually we are, we're not an energy uh, agency per se. We actually, our, our primary mandate as, as a UN, uh, UN agency is to promote industrial development. And, and, uh, and part of that mm -hmm. role is to promote also low carbon industrial development. And the, the only, the major connection between the low carbon and the industrial development is the energy supply primarily the energy access and the energy infrastructure or the infrastructure for industrialization. And our, our sort of uh, a large part of our constituency are, are low, low income countries that are aspiring to put on an industrial infrastructure, um, complex, not complex, but ambitious, what I call ambitious industrial uh, parks and, and like Ethiopia, Tanzania, um, so, so how are you going to power all this? And so there's a dialogue we enter into with the members, with, with these countries to, to, to look at options um, to, to power industrialization through um, a low carbon infrastructure. Um, and, and the models that we see emerging, captive markets for renewable energy around industrial parks, where, where is, an, is an option, where also um, distributed generation and, but again, we, we're looking at massive amount of energy we need. And, and without bringing the utilities on board, you cannot really uh, power industrialization uh, uh, with the kind of amount of energy and, 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 uh, uh, that, that is needed. And here is exactly, we come back to the, to the questions that, that, um, uh, that was raised here is, what are the policy framework that, that we need in place to get either, public sector investment and private sector investment to, to do this. And, and, and the, again, the challenges are, are varied across. Um, so, so that's one part of the equation. Then the, the, bigger, the bigger challenge where we have to play is, is, is 
is the, 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 the broader ambition of, uh, uh, that was Nancy referred to is, is the 100% renewable uh, energy by 2030, 2050. And, and to get to that, you need to do the investments today, particularly if you're talking about hydrogen as a, as a fuel. So the infrastructure for hydrogen, green hydrogen, um, the, the grid infrastructure, the storage capacities. So all that from a project preparation to a project development, um, to, to, so, so, so the decision have to be made today actually to meet the targets 2050 uh, from, from a, and that's a, a political uh, commitment. And, and I think that's part of the role we try to, to engage with. And, and you cannot do it also advanced economies versus development. You have to bring countries like China, India, Brazil, uh, Argentina on board with this kind of transition to make it work. So, so this is the, 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 the challenge uh, that, that uh, we, we, we talk about. So when, when you talk about investment, in, I know that you and I were chatting before about uh, the technology gap that you, you see uh, in, in looking pan-regionally, uh, what are those technologies that need to be investment sooner than later? <laughs> no. um, well, I mean, I mean um, a, lot, a lot of the, the I, I would call the, sort of the renewable generation side actually is, is quite a lot of the technologies are, 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 are as, as probably mentioned, are out there and economically feasible. It is the integration of, of, of technology. So, 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 so innovation that create a reliable um, system uh, so, so, uh, that can deliver 24 hours energy um, um, uh, to customers. So, so, so there are a bit of challenges on the integration where we need a slightly more investment. And I think the emergence and convergence of digital technologies is around smart grids is is moving the ball forward in that side. Of course, hydrogen, still we need to do a lot of investment in, in, in pilot demonstration and scale up uh, and, and that to bring the cost down. We're talking about uh, uh, a cost reduction uh, to make it commercially viable in terms of five, five X, uh, five factors to, 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 to reach. And so that there we're talking about, um, uh, uh, about um, uh, scale up of the demonstration and the, the, uh, um, the uh, deployment um, on the, uh, of course, on the uh, energy access front, I mean, the technologies are there, but I think it's, we're, we're dealing with different types of challenges in terms of affordability, business models, getting, getting um, uh, also the, the ecosystem to, uh, to attract uh, investments to these um, frontier markets. So, so, um, uh, so that's one side on the, uh, the, the biggest, uh, from our point of view, at least as, a, as, a, as an industrial agency, the biggest problem is with the heart, with what you call the heart of the sectors, uh, like decarbonizing um, 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 those sectors like steel, cement, petrochemicals, um, fertilizers, uh, and there is, 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 you cannot deal with, with the problem there with, uh, with electrification uh, as, a, as a pathway. So you have to look at also fuel switching, and again, hydrogen, uh, hydrogen comes into the equation, um, carbon capture and storage comes into the story. So, so, so that, that, is, um, that would be actually some of the most difficult sectors to, to bring to, to, towards a, um, a path of, of low carbon or, or zero carbon uh, scenarios. Mm. Hydrogen, is a, hydrogen is a pretty popular <laughs> subject these days and so popular, we're going to do a whole thing just on hydrogen. So I'm not gonna ask any more questions about that, but I wanna, Sebastian and, and uh, Tarek, what about the, this kind of scheme uh, that uh, Sebastian uh, did in, uh, Argentina is there oper is it, is it an opportunity to do that kind of thing in other areas that obviously have the same problems either well, one both or everybody <laughs> we are um, I'm working in that uh, we founded Grim map Grim map is uh, as as told you um, a platform that uh, we build for developing um, a 2.0 of what we have done. That means to incorporate a lot of extra tools that I wish I had the chance 
to incorporate at the time I was uh, in power. Of course, I didn't have the resources, the, the time I was uh, in the government. So imagine the, um, the, the frenzy that, that, we, that we faced. So um, we strongly believe that if we were able uh, to do what we have done in a country that is perhaps among the most difficult countries today in the world to attract long-term investment, we are absolutely able to promote it. Uh, I wouldn't say everywhere because everywhere is too much, but in many, many, many others. I mean, you, if, you, if you put away Europe, the States, Canada, Japan, Australia, pretty much these countries, this group of countries, the rest of the world, which is more than half, suffers about pretty much the same things. So uh, political constraints, inconvertibility issues, intransferability issues, and the uh, supposed non-possibility to build long-term infrastructure. So if you are an international investor, and if you would like to go to a country that is used to change the rules every day, you, will, you won't do your investment there, you, you won't go. Uh, or if you go, you go for a payback that represents something that covers your risk. And that means that in most of the emerging countries with wind and solar resources that are pretty much everywhere in an amazing way, these markets are those that pay twice, three times or even more for the electricity coming from the resources that they do have in their lands thanks to the political constraints. So if we are not able to the risk properly with uh, proper policies and schemes, the country risk, we are not gonna be able to bring capital for long-term infrastructure for energy in this case, and for many other kinds of infrastructure as well. Would you, would you agree, Chuck? You're on mute. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think exactly, I mean, Sebastian touched exactly on the issue of attracting uh, capital. Uh, when I said the, 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 the price of technology, the production side has come down so much that it's attractive. But, but again, I mean, if you are going to countries where the utility cannot invest, the government cannot invest, you want to attract the, then your rust is always to bring the private sector. But then, of course, you have to create the framework condition where the private sector is investing in this. And, 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 and deal with all the, 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 the de-risking scenarios that are, are, are necessary. And most of that comes to country risk, uh, not technology risk anymore to, to, to a large exactly. extent. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, we're about to uh, move into uh, Q&A from the audience and I see a number of, of questions out there. Please write your questions down and then we'll figure out how to uh, allow you to uh, uh, ask them in person. Um, so while you're uh, doing that, I have a couple other ones to, um, uh, what do we do? Um, let me take it. This is a simple question, but it's, it's difficult. Um, you have one thing that you could do to change, okay? to make this one thing that we could do to make this shift to 100% um, uh, uh, renewables, either faster or more likely. What's that one thing? And Nancy, since you've been quiet this whole time, uh, you're going to be up uh, first on that. Oh boy! Uh, <laughs> and there's no right answer. Obviously, there's uh, lots of there's lots of one things, right? But, yeah. Well, I think I think there's well maybe I'll, I'll go for two things. One, I think I think <laughs> policies is really important uh, as we've been talking about, and um, and but it's got to be policy that means something. In commitments that that people can, you know, rely on. Um, so, you know, I think that does help unlock a lot. And then I think the other is just, um, you know, really thinking broadly about, um, at least in the case of California, um, bringing in the transportation sector, bringing in the building sector, uh, um, yeah. and you know, thinking about how you do your planning. Um, an investment to ensure that that you're capturing sort of those uh, opportunities 
in in the building sector and in transportation. Jorge, so two things. Jorge, what's your uh, uh, one thing or two things? No, <laughs> I'll I'll try to keep it high level and one thing. I want to move away from this idea that we're in this because we're doing good. And I want us to reframe this. Uh -huh. we're, this is good business. This makes sense. <laughs> because doing good carries too much judgmental baggage. And there will be some countries and that will move faster than others. Yeah, we're doing good. But it's also good business. That's a and really excellent point. <laughs> That's an yeah. excellent point. Yeah. So that would I would change that. Everybody, please change that. Marcos, you're next. So friendly long-term policy framework for renewable energy and batteries. Long term. Interesting. Great. Mm -hmm. um, I think all points I've said are important. So mine would come as a complementary, complementary to the rest where I think we see an important role for standards and, and bringing consumer confidence in the technology. So, so we, we're, we're actively promoting quality infrastructure, particularly in developing and emerging economies so that consumer are confident with the, with the technology, with the solutions, so standards and capacities um, for uh, maintenance and operation and, and, and uh, because it's also renewable technologies are broad range. You, you can talk about also solar thermal energy for, for, for heat, where uh, it's a very simple technology, but, uh, but you have also kind of, the market is flooded with defunct solutions that loses the customer confidence. So, so uh, standards are important part of the game here. Mm. And Sebastian. Uh, Fred, uh, what I would say is, uh, you know, capital is everywhere. So capital is not the problem, uh, not at all. And technology is, 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 is not even. Uh, so innovation in policy is definitely for me what we, what we have to do if we have to say um, one thing. You can imagine that bringing, uh, bringing capital for long term, I mean, this is a good business as Jorge said, but you need to compete. We need to make this a good competition. Um, in, in Argentina, we demonstrated that renewables are the cheapest option by incorporating long -term, real long-term uh, projects. The only way to make this happen is by incorporating uh, long-term. And for doing that in most of the world, most of the world, we need innovation in policy. That's the only way. Because the rest, we have it. Absolutely. Interesting. Okay, we're going to go to the audience and take some Q&A. Um, um, we're going to start with Tanya Cole. Uh, and Tanya, I'm going to make you, uh, uh, give you uh, the ability to talk here. Look at this. Technology is wonderful. Um, Tanya and I, uh, Tanya's from the State Department. We met in Ethiopia, of all places. Uh, it's good to at least hear you, Tanya, if I can't see you. Um, can you uh, hear me? And can you? Uh, I think I've I think I've enabled you to yes. speak. All right. Yes. <laughs> Please. Hey, Fred. It's so <laughs> great. I feel like I'm almost back at home. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, did you get my question, or should I ask the question again? I think yes? you should ask the question again. Okay. So, um, so I think my question was really uh, one of the things that we're struggling with here is. Um, and moving towards this rapid um, carbon neutral process, how do we balance like giving incentives, um, investment incentives for companies um, to have localized manufacturing like of solar panels, batteries for electrical vehicles and other things that are in the supply chain um, so that we can sort of balance the shortage of having to go to one single market. And I won't do any name calling, but I think that's just something that's definitely been on our agenda um, because it's one thing to tell people, okay, we need to have more local, localized manufacturing. We need to scale up, we need to bring investment. But it's another thing if the capacity is not there and at the same time, we're running this carbon neutral race. 
Thank you very much. And great to see you, Fred. I miss you so much. Yeah, you know. We're trying to bring you to Milan, Italy. I'm still doing it. <laughs> okay. I look forward to it. Okay, anybody can jump on that. I think I've I mean, yeah. If I may jump quickly, because um, this is exactly one of the questions that we have also um, struggled with in response to our the demand from our member states that wants to, to really build capacities in solar technologies or or value chain for renewable energy technology. But I think the model to look at is Morocco. Morocco is one of the countries that have done it well. They have designed their auction scheme uh, for, um, um, for uh, large scale utility, um, solar and, and wind and uh, solar thermal, uh, concentrated solar thermal power with um, a strong element of uh, local content and, and uh, and, and joint venture and partnerships to bring the uh, value uh, um, value addition to the country as well, uh, or part of the value chain. And, and I think there is, you have to balance there between also requirements of international finance and, and yeah. uh, on, on that equation vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, of course, uh, a government policy to drive um, uh, local content to the, the degree that is possible. and and. And actually, Morocco did it in a gradual phase uh, with maximum 30% local content and substantially uh, the, the, the partners they worked with managed to increase it in some part of the project up to 80%, which is a high percent local content, especially in the um, concentrated solar thermal technologies. That's, a, that's an impressive feat so, so for Morocco. So I think their case study is one to, to, to look at very carefully and, and clearly. Um, um, and, 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 and partly it's linked with also your science, technology, education, uh, infrastructure or policies. You cannot disconnect the two together. So the coherence between, between the energy policy and, and uh, um, the science, technology or industrial policy needs to come together around these um, two, two uh, issues. Um, right, if I can complement what uh, Tarek said. Um... May I? Yeah, oh, oh, sure, I'm sorry, of course. <laughs> uh, no, th that's, that's key. I mean, um, in my experience, um, international finance and particularly MDVs, so multilateral organizations, uh, don't like, I, I would say don't like much, but uh, I think that the right word is don't, don't like at all um, to incorporate local content in the procurement processes uh, particularly in emerging markets, and uh, and this is a challenge. But because you can imagine, if you are, I mean, if you are in a country or in a market that is not um, familiar with industry, I mean, it's, it's not really an industrial country. That might be pretty much okay internally. But when you are talking about uh, a procurement process in a country that is an industrial country that manufactures pretty much everything uh, at scale, but pretty much everything. Uh, you can imagine the resistance in the unions. You can imagine the resistance in the industry itself. Uh, uh, when, when you fight this idea of incorporation of local content versus the impossibility to incorporate thanks to the comments that you receive from the international financial corporations that are those that at the end of the story will put part of the a uh, few, few uh, part, part of, of the capital that you need to build the infrastructure. So uh, my experience is that any way it is possible, we brought uh, nine factories in the country in the same two years time frame, uh, two global wind turbine manufacturers, solar truckers and uh, tower manufacturers for the wind industry as well. Um, 11,000 new positions, new jobs in the industry itself. So it is, it is not minor uh, what you can do, but I can tell you that it is uh, not easy at all. Of course, everyone would like to incorporate local content. Who can tell you I don't want to do it? No, I mean, yes. Um, and particularly in uh, industrial economies. But when you go there to speak with multilaterals and finance, different kinds of financial organizations, this is among the first things that they check. If you have incorporated something in your formula in the procurement process, they are not in. So imagine the challenge that you face. 
but it's possible. You can do it anyway. Excellent. Thank you. Um, next up is a gentleman by the name of Mohammed. Mohammed, I th well, first of all, I think he's written down his question in chat that the panelists can see, but I'm going to um, turn your talkability on. There you go, I think. Um, and please introduce yourself and then uh, ask the questions. And I think the question is primarily aimed at you, Sebastian. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, thank you very much. My name is Hamad. I'm working for UNIDO in Pakistan. Uh, I just wanted to uh, learn from the experience of Mr. Sebastian in Argentina. You mentioned about this rollover financing. Is it something like uh, credit risk guarantee? And what are the lessons learned that can be implemented in uh, other countries like Pakistan and other developing countries? Uh, well, thank you for, for your question. Um, this is something uh, somehow different. What we have implemented is uh, three levels of warranty. And the first one is the one that is uh, rolling over uh, the PPA. So it's along the 20 years PPA that we developed a one year, 12 months of a sort of scroll account that we have incorporated with capital in advance. Uh, okay. basically to cover energy payment. So um, everything is for credit enhancement. I, I wouldn't put just a label to this because this is quite perhaps uh, innovative in terms of the way it was structured. Um, but of course, this plays in favor to particularly uh, the fact that the off-taker was in the history not uh, covering the payments on due date. So basically to favor the projects to go for project finance, which is, as you know, um, one of the most important uh, things that you have to uh, have enhanced before you sign your contract is the uh, basically to, to have this risk cover of, of the payments on, uh, to receive the payments on due date. Okay, great. Okay, Thank next you. next is uh, Paolo, um, who is a uh, associate of mine at Engine. Paolo, uh, you're on. And you can introduce yourself because I'm not sure everybody knows you. Uh, hi, good good morning. I'm Paulo de Rezende, uh, BP Investments Engine. And I uh, appreciate your uh, panel and the discussion. We're talking mostly about large scale project finance, uh, multi uh, megawatt, gigawatt scale. But when you go into the uh, distributed generation at the household level, so to say, how do you use? the available technology uh, to be able to implement these small scale projects in particular, what kind of financial innovation is happening at that level so that other places uh, can uh, invest in renewable energy without the need for the schemes that we're talking about, Renovar and other um, national schemes that were discussed here. Thank you. Who's going to attack that? Okay, Corey. So uh, let me let me take this on first. Um, yeah, thank you very much for that question. Uh, this comes up a fair amount because uh, large grid connected projects have a certain structure and are of a certain you know have a certain ticket price or a ticket an ask as we call it. Um, but for smaller projects, it's, it's, it's more complicated. And it's not entirely about the financial innovation itself. What we have discovered, it's more about the business model innovation. So that's how you can proceed. Um, you can, it, what you have to do in the end, the, the rules, the, found, the fundamentals tend to be the same. Scale is important. You, it's hard to get scale when you, when you have when you're in a rural area, for example, or even when you're in a city, in a large urban setting, and you're trying to connect, um, and you're trying to finance the connections, uh, for instance, in a favela in, in Rio, and, and that's not so easy to do necessarily, financing that. So what mm -hmm. ends up happening is that community associations, community power companies, or co community or mm -hmm. cooperatives that are built neighborhood cooperatives, power cooperatives are being formed. And so what that permits is that allows a certain amount of scale. And then you mix it with a little bit of blended finance, a little bit of grant financing, and then a little bit of soft financing. And sometimes even the utility company or an energy company will get involved uh, in, order to, in, in order to 
in order to put the entire puzzle pieces together. So it's not necessarily you're going to find a significant innovation, although you, you will, uh, directly targeting this. Sometimes it's a bit of a different uh, series of orchestra pieces that you have to put together. One technical element, you can also integrate pay-as-you-go services or just offer the service in a different way. In that sense, uh, there is a lower capital cost for the individual user and, uh, and then the investor who comes in with these types of initiatives uh, benefits, still gets their return, provides the service, addresses the repayment issues, uh, and in that way is able to kind of round out the process. But I'll say in Africa, it works differently than in the Caribbean, than in Central America, than in South America. So there is no specific formula, but we've learned a great deal in the process. And a lot of it has to do with business model. Interesting. Um, we're, we're nearing the end of our uh, time together. I don't see any other uh, questions so far from the audience. So I'm gonna turn it back to the panelists. Are there, is there something that you are dying to talk about or a question you're dying to ask uh, because now's the time to do it. <laughs> Look at that, see, you're all so satisfied with uh, uh, the intake of information. Well, I have, okay, I have a question that's probably a touch weird, but that's because well, let's not go into that. Uh, and this has to, and this comes out of the study that uh, uh, DWP did in, in Literally, the importance of electrification of the transportation uh, has a really major impact. Do, do you think that's going to have the same kind of impact in other places uh, other than California and Los Angeles? Uh, is that still going to be such a driving factor, I guess? I, I would say, uh, I'm sorry to step in here Please. quickly. Uh, um, electric mobility is a game changer but it's a little further along in the country, in Latin America and the Caribbean, where I see it uh, in terms of, but it is a game changer. I think that based on the markets that I've seen, this was alluded to by Sebastian as well. And also, um, and it was also alluded uh, in Mexico, uh, the, the strengthening of transmission and distribution. I think investments and upgrades in transmission and distribution are significantly important both for the extension of renewable energies, but also for electric mobility or the eventual integration of green hydrogen into the space. Interesting. Uh, Sebastian? Uh, well, nothing, nothing really to add. I mean, what Jorge, what Jorge said is, is, is precise. Yeah, Great. I think it's, it is what... Marcus? Fred, I would say, um, I agree with Jorge, but uh, transportation is going to, uh, electrification of transportation is going to play a big role in the long term because um, transmission lines and distribution lines are not ready in Mexico, for example. And I guess that in many countries in Latin America, for getting all these new uh, consume or energy consume from, from the electric cars. So first of all, we need a, mo a modernization of the, of the grid then implementing more renewable energy and then uh, electrification of the transportation. Sorry, Fred, it's coming. As, as uh, Marco said, uh, of course, it's coming slow everywhere in, in emerging economies. And basically, may not, uh, based on the same reasons that we were discussing along this conversation. Um, so imagine if you don't have the resources to incorporate this kind of infrastructure, and you have to go to the private sector. And again, we are struggling with the same kind of problem. So it's, uh, it's key the way we, we develop the right policies for this as well. Okay, uh, folks, I think we've reached the end of this uh, session. First of all, thank you very, very much. Uh, it's been, I hope it's been interesting for you. It certainly has been for me. Um, we have an, uh, another one of these sessions tomorrow at the same time totally different uh, perspective because it's going to be in, in the developed world. It's going to have a, a, a greater uh, number of utilities and corporations and so forth. So uh, if you uh, are uh, ready for some more punishment, I encourage you to uh, attend that. Uh, Nancy and DWP, thank you once again for hosting this. This has been terrific. And thank you all for uh, uh, attending. We'll do it. Thank again. you, Fred, very much.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Thank you and thank much. you all. It's learned a lot from all of you. Thank you. Thank you all. Ciao. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much.